who served in World War II and every war on both sides, and remembering those families who grieve, and the thousands of families who have waited decades for a day like today, we pray that we would discover hope for today and purpose and meaning for our own lives in what we remember today. Remembering young Billy Calkins today celebrates a discovery. The Manila American Cemetery and Memorial in the Philippines occupies 152 acres on a prominent plateau in the capital city. It contains the largest number of graves of our military dead from World War II, a total of 16,859, most of whom lost their lives in operations in New Guinea and in the Philippines. As their website states, the, the Manila American Cemetery tells an epic story of sacrifice and valor in the service of liberty. Among the war dead are 29 Medal of Honor recipients. There are 20 sets of brothers who lie side by side. There are over 500 Philippine scouts who served alongside their American comrades and are buried there together with them. In the center of those peaceful grounds stands a beautiful white marble memorial chapel. The chapel's facade features sculptures depicting St. George fighting the dragon and personifications of liberty, justice, and country. A limestone hemisphere monument features the tablets of the missing. And those tablets contain 36,286 names. Wow. 36,000. 286. Billy's name is permanently inscribed on those tablets at the Manila American Cemetery and Memorial. But from now on, his name will forever be adorned with a brass rosette, signifying that Billy's remains will now rest in a known grave. Currently, there are 439 rosettes found on those tablets. 439 people formerly missing are now identified and rest in known graves. 439 families now know where their loved ones are laid to rest. And indeed, if you search Billy's name on the American Battle Monuments Commission website. You will see that William E. Culkin's status now states recovered. Recovered. And today, remembered. Billy's enlistment story is quite profound. Most of you have probably heard some of the story in Hence, you're gathered here today with us, but I think it bears repeating. With the war in Europe, concern over the threat of war had spurred President Roosevelt and Congress to approve the nation's first peacetime military draft in September of 1940. But a lot of people, and Billy included, enlisted rather than wait to be drafted. By December of 1941, America's military had grown to nearly 2.2 million soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. A 1943 Salem Statesman Journal article announcing his death noted that in order to join the military, Billy Calkins had convinced a friend that he was an orphan. I think we'll forgive him that. <laughs> the acquaintance signed off on his volunteer enlistment in the military as his guardian because Billy was under 18 at the time. His family's history tells us that he'd run away from home and lied about his age to enlist at age 16. And whatever precisely motivated his decisions, we'll never know, but that narrative will always be overlaid against the heroism and sacrifice of thousands of people like Billy. Upon enlistment, 
Young Billy Calkins was assigned to Company B, 31st Infantry Regiment, serving in the Philippines. The Army's historical foundation history of the 31st Infantry Regiment tells their story, and I think their I think that story is important to help us remember his death in context. The, 30, the 31st Infantry was organized in Manila in 1916, and as an interesting side note, you'll see this in the, your program, the regiment's nickname was the Polar Bears. That recalls their service as an expeditionary force in Siberia from 1918 to 1920. The regiment also saw service in Shanghai in the early 20s, so the, the regiment already had a history in the Philippines when World War II broke out. And Billy was already there in December 1941. And that date, that lives in infamy. When war seemed imminent in the Pacific, General Douglas MacArthur, who was the military advisor to the Philippine government, had begun preparations for national defense and augmenting the Philippine armed forces. The Philippine division, including the 31st Infantry, was the nucleus of a largely Filipino defense force. After the Japanese struck the U.S. fleet at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, on 7 December 1941, Japanese planes shortly thereafter struck the Philippines on the morning of the 8th, destroying most of MacArthur's air power. The Philippine division was held in reserve around Manila in the Bataan Peninsula to support the beach defense forces if needed and prepare defenses on Bataan and Corregidor Island. The Japanese landed on December 10th, encountering little resistance. Then the Japanese 14th Army arrived on December 22nd and forced MacArthur to order a hasty withdrawal to Bataan and Corregidor. The 31st Infantry, including Company B and young Private Billy Calkins, still not yet 17 years old, was assigned to cover the withdrawal of units onto the peninsula. As a result of their rapid retreat, many units were forced to abandon crucial supplies and heavy weapons. In order to allow the defensive lines time to stabilize, on January 6, 1942, MacArthur ordered the 31st to fight a delaying action against elements of the Japanese. They incurred heavy casualties by the time they rejoined the main defensive lines on the 9th. Despite dwindling supplies and mounting losses, the 31st and other units defending Bataan managed to halt the Japanese advance and force them to withdraw while they awaited reinforcements from China over the next several weeks mm. before they renewed their offensive. It's a harsh environment to fight in the jungle. Disease such as malaria and dysentery became rampant on both sides, particularly as medical supplies were exhausted. 50% of the 31st Infantry and the rest of the, the defenders were sick and malnourished by the time the Japanese renewed their offensive in early April of 1942. As American and Filipino forces on Bataan surrendered to the Japanese on April 9th, remnants of the 31st escaped to Corregidor, but Corregidor too would fall on May 6th. What then transpired in the Philippines about 7,000 miles from Hillsboro, Oregon, from April 10th through April 17th, 1942, would become known as the Bataan Death March. Nearly 80,000 captured defenders, approximately 12,000 of whom were Americans, were marched up the Philippine National Highway for 65 miles up the Bataan Peninsula to San Fernando, more than a thousand Americans died or were murdered along the way. They were moved on, fo on foot without food or water to San Fernando where many were loaded onto boxcars. Next they rode to Capas, then walked seven more miles to Camp O'Donnell, a former Philippine Army recruit training camp. Roughly half of the surviving American PWs were transferred to what was now known as Cabanatuan, a complex of multiple prison camps. And the Japanese were unprepared for the large number of captives they held. And if you read about conditions, they were unbelievably desperate. 
Americans held captive in the Pacific confronted starvation, disease, despair, brutality, and death. Behind bars and barbed wire, they waited year after year, looking to the skies, praying for release or rescue, and many died waiting. According to prison camp and other historical records, 17-year-old Billy Calkins died on November 1st, 1942, and was buried in the local Cabanatuan Camp Cemetery. In total, more than 2,500 other prisoners of war perished at that camp. One of those prisoners was a chaplain named Robert Preston Taylor. Chaplain Taylor survived the march and the camps and went on to become chief of chaplains for the United States Air Force and a two-star general by the time he retired. He was remembered as one of the most well-known officers by both the Americans and the Japanese. He ministered to thousands of fellow prisoners of war in the camps. While not specifically recorded, it may have been that he even ministered to Billy before he died. In an oral history interview conducted in 1974, Chaplain Taylor talked about the young men, many of whom were 17, 18, or 19 years old in those camps. He was asked how they could keep faith to try to survive and to maintain hope. Taylor answered, quote, we did it frankly in a very positive way by saying to our men, and these opportunities came quite often, our answer was always, there is hope. There is faith. And the thing you need to do is keep your chin up and keep faith with your Lord and faith with your family and faith with your church because this thing will be over one of these days. We can't tell you when it'll be, but we're in the same plight you are, and we believe it's going to be over. So come on now, let's get with it and stay with it. Chaplain Taylor said there's nothing of greater encouragement to anyone than to believe that there's going to be an end to things like that. And we were just sure there would be an end. He said, you've got to have this hope. You've got to have this faith that this thing will come about. And it takes that in a prison camp. Chaplain Taylor said he, he wasn't special. He reminded us all that to love and to serve others is the key in any difficulty we might face. Part of the Army's warrior creed is the promise that I will never leave a fallen comrade. That's our pledge to each and every service member and their families. And thanks to the Defense POW and MIA Accounting Agency, Billy Calkins was finally accounted for on April 17th, 2024. Today, we honor that promise we made to Billy when he raised his right hand and was enlisted into the regular army in 1941. And God willing, we'll bring them all home. Many of you perhaps have participated in a POW MIA missing man table ceremony. It's a dignified and solemn moment in many formal dinners and occasions. There are a lot of different narratives that are written for those ceremonies, but the symbolism is consistent and it's profound. If even for many who participate, the missing are nameless. Often, each item in that display is described together with its meaning, and each item is described with a simple refrain repeated throughout the ceremony, remember. Part of what today is about is that Private Billy Calkins, U.S. Army, is not simply recovered, but remembered. That his family is remembered. And we remember the thousands whose remains have never been found and the thousands more whose identity await discovery. And we remember. That remembrance gives us pause to consider our purpose and meaning for each of our lives in the present and reflect on our hope for the future. I chose Psalm 23 for today in part because of its familiarity, but mostly because it gives us an opportunity to remember that we have hope. 
Psalm 23 is not a promise that life will be easy. It's a message of hope in the midst of the dark times, whenever they may come. It's a message of hope that each of us is loved and watched over by a God who cares. A God who cared so much that he gave his son, Jesus, to be our hope by his death for the forgiveness of sin and his resurrection so that you and I would know that death is not the end of the story. Were it not for this fact, the 23rd Psalm would just be maybe a pretty poem. But these Psalms give us hope because Jesus rose so that we know that the violent the violence and death and, also, and often gruesome sufferings in this life are not forever. One day all things will be made new. Death will be abolished and we will know no more war. No matter where you are in your journey, you're surrounded by opportunities to make life better for those around you, to share your life, your love, your faith, and your hope with each other and with the world. And my prayer for you is that even while we grieve Billy's loss, you can be thankful for people like him and find ways to honor their sacrifices. There are countless ways for us to love and to serve the people around us if we look around.